Good morning, everybody, and welcome to CWSA, the greatest thing that's ever happened to you, probably. And if you'd like your experience today, which is already phenomenal, to go up to levels that I just can't even explain, it's so good. Well, all you need to do that is a cup or a mug or a glass, a tank or a stein, a canteen jug or a flask, a vessel of any kind. Fill it with your favorite liquid I like, coffee, and join me now for the unparalleled pleasure, the dopamine of the day, the thing that makes everything better, including spackling. It's called <laughs> the simultaneous sip. It happens now. Go. That was so good. So yesterday I had a really good, terrible day. Uh, I don't know if any of you experienced anything like this. It was very good and terrible at the same time. It was very good in the sense that everything that happened yesterday was good. I had delicious food. I exercised. The weather was perfect. I spent quality time with my dog. I had some social activities. I got a lot done. I got a lot done. Even got my dog door fixed. I mean, everything was just just clicking, just clicking. And do you know why it was terrible? Because there are two major wars in the world right now that are completely on my mind all the time, you know, one more than the other at the moment. And I can't take myself out of the head of what it would be like to be under siege. You know, what, what would it be like? I mean, how, how, how many levels of hell is that? I mean, whatever it is, it's, you know, maximum hell. But I found, I found it difficult to enjoy myself, even though I had no problems yesterday. Did anybody have that experience? The, the experience of feeling literally guilty that you had a good day? Because when you watch people who are in such dire straits, I mean, it's not like people haven't been in dire straits around the, the world forever. But now it's just being pounded into us. You know, our, our media is feeding it to us in a different way. Now, I have to say, I did not feel the same about Ukraine. Why is that? I mean, I felt, you know, the normal amount of empathy. But my life just sort of goes on. But there's something about Gaza that's just a little extra. I don't know what it is. Could be it's just the combined weight of things. All right, well, as you know, my famous story that I say way too often, but I've come to the conclusion that I can't say it enough because it might be the most important thing in at least America. Our food is killing us. You know that, right? Our food source is just deadly. So I was just trying to avoid inflammation. You know, I keep talking about it. And I tell you that a few, just, I don't know, several months ago, and for a few years during the pandemic especially, I was so sore all the time that I'm, life just was barely worth living, honestly. I could barely walk upstairs. And I couldn't figure out what it was. So I ch- made some changes to my diet, and it just completely stopped. So yesterday, long walk. Full, you know, full exercise. Not a single, not a single bit of inflammation. Full exercise. Not a sore, not anything. Just, just a change of diet. I think that's the only thing I changed. Now, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but one of the habits I changed was, you know, famously, I would always eat a bagel right after the show. I would always talk about waiting for my bagel because it's so good. But I decided to, you know, I, I gained a few pounds, and usually I have a trigger at about five pounds, right? If I if I creep up five pounds, which I usually do in the winter, then I'll reverse things and, you know, try to slowly come down. So I stopped eating bread and started with not eating the bagels. And I started to suspect that maybe bread was my problem because not long after that, my inflammation went away. And... So I Googled, do bagels cause inflammation? You should try that sometime. 
<laughs> yeah. Google, do bagels cause inflammation? Well, according to the internet, they do. According to the internet. Now, some people say it's the gluten. I don't know that it's that. Some people say it's the um, some kind of preservatives. I don't know that it's that. Because uh, they say it doesn't. it's not the same in Europe because the preservatives are different. Um, but some say it's something to do with the pesticides that are put on the wheat and that we're getting it in our bodies. I don't know if any of that's true. So I'm not going to make any claims of fact. I will just tell you that when I started looking into what foods cause inflammation, it's basically anything with added sugar. Uh, that takes away a third of your diet right there. Any grains. Now, I don't know if this is true. So this is not, I'm not expressing this as fact. I'm telling you that if you look on the internet or listen to other people who seem to know what they're talking about, they'll tell you don't eat sugar, any kind of grains, bread, pasta, oatmeal, any kind of pre-made packaged foods, anything with vegetable oil, that's almost everything, anything with preservatives, almost every kind of sauce or liquid that isn't water. Um, and then and then my favorite category, the so-called nightshade foods, nightshade. If you're not familiar with that term, that's stuff like tomatoes, potatoes, and eggplants. Some say red meat is a problem. Others say red meat is a solution. I've got a feeling it's more like a solution than a problem. And I'm a vegetarian, so I'm, I'm speaking against my own diet. Uh, actually, I'm a pescatarian, technically. So what does that leave? If you were going to try to have you know, no inflammation in your diet, that would give you some vegetables, but you'd have to stay away from the you know, potatoes and eggplants. Um, most fruit, but you'd have to stay away from tomatoes, I guess. Um, you could do some clean forms of meat, probably eggs, maybe. And that's about it. Oh, nuts. If you're not allergic to nuts, <laughs> so that's another thing, your allergies. <laughs> so I'm not allergic to nuts. So I, so I experimented. <laughs> I experimented eating a lot of you know strawberries and blueberries that are supposed to be especially good. Um, I don't recommend nuts because I think maybe enough people have nut allergies that I wouldn't recommend it. But I don't. And when I ate completely clean, I had two observations. One, I never felt better. I mean, everything felt better from my mind to my body in every way. felt better. And um, I was super unhappy because uh, I didn't enjoy eating. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you just want to eat. You, you want to just enjoy the feeling. But man, you don't really get much of that if you eat boring food. So that's my... Uh, my suggestion is that all uh, grocery stores should be reorganized, and the grocery stores should be reorganized by inflammation. Now, some people said incorrectly, but Scott, it already is. What, what you do is you go in the store and you only go around the perimeter, because the perimeter is all the, the fresh, healthy stuff. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. <laughs> that would include all of your nightshade that allegedly causes inflammation. I don't know if that's true, by the way. It would include the entire bread and bakery department. That's all sketchy. Right. And I'm not entirely positive that the frozen foods are all bad. I mean, I don't, I don't, I try to avoid them, but I'm not sure they're all bad, are they? So imagine if you organized a store by inflammation. All right, I've got another theory that I'm going to trot out. You know how when you get old, you could die from a whole variety of things that are associated with age, more than just about anything else they're associated with, right? There's a bunch of old people things that don't bother other people. Is it my imagination, or are all of those old people problems related to inflammation? I feel like old people have primarily one problem. It's that they eat shit. The, the, this is my new hypothesis, is that some percent of age-related problems you would not die from 
if not for the fact your food source had caused you to be so inflamed that you couldn't protect yourself anymore. And I've got a theory that with age uh, and maybe less activity especially, you're just less able to deal with inflammation. And the inflammation is just the whole story, you know, or, or let's say 80% of the story. And that if you got rid of your inflammation, you'd sort of cruise into the age 90, you know, unless something specific gotcha. That's just a guess, just a hypothesis. There's new battery technology. I'm always telling you about this, but who knows if this will become real. Toyota has got some new technology that allow you to go over 900 miles on a 10-minute charge. 900 miles on a 10-minute charge. Now, apparently they're making this operational, so this is not just a laboratory thing. They're, they're going to manufacturing. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. And then we have to ask some questions about, you know, how many slaves do you need to mine the materials and uh, how many wars will we have to get more of it? That sort of thing. All right. More on Scott is right about everything. Um, I might be the only economist, I say with quotes, economist, who said that the odds of a recession were not that high. And I, I said it was either going to be mild or none. And now the uh, experts have turned in that direction, uh, not completely, but more than half of the experts, according to the Wall Street Journal, are saying that uh, things might be okay and we might not go into a full recession. So a little bit of optimism. At the same time, the world is falling apart in every single way. How is it that we have two critical wars and inflation through the roof and debt we have no idea how to handle? And the experts just said, yeah, it's looking good. I mean, I said the same thing, but it's pretty hard to predict, isn't it? It's like economics is just guessing. Then I saw also in the Wall Street Journal that the price of gas is starting to trend down, mostly because summer is over, but it will help. I mean, if you're still commuting to work, wouldn't it be nice if your prices were down? And I looked at the prices, and I thought I was misreading it. I'll tell you why. So I said over the past month, uh, some prices, let's say in Athens, Georgia, um, are down to two, $2.92 a gallon. And I read this and I go, wait a minute. In Georgia, that would be a state in the United States? There's a place in the United States in the year 2023 that you can buy a gallon of gas for $2.92 today. So I said to myself, what does it cost me in California? Because I, I had a number in my mind, but I thought I must be crazy. Have I just not noticed? So I Googled it, and it was the same number I had in my mind, $5.50. So a gallon of gas where I live is $5.50. But if I lived in Georgia, it would be $2.92. Oh, my God. So, so a number of you are saying you're paying sub $3. God, if I ever saw a gallon of gas under $3, I, I would think I'd go into heaven. I don't think I'll ever see it again in California. But anyway, there might be some relief on that side of things. And a lot of it is because people aren't commuting. And a lot of people are choosing to travel less. There are two things going on in my life that would influence me to travel less. I want to see if this is influencing anybody else. Number one is the cost of gas. I'm not as sensitive to that. But um, is anybody traveling less because of the cost of gas? I just want to see in the comments. Oh, interestingly, I'm seeing mostly no's, but there are a lot of yeses. Oh, more, more yeses coming, more no's. All right. So there are quite a few of you who are traveling less because of the cost of gas. Here's the second question. How many of you are traveling less because your social network got destroyed during the pandemic and or you became less social because you just got trained not to see people? Whoa, look at the yeses now. I feel like the... 
uh, pandemic permanently changed me. My, my ability to socialize is kind of almost gone. Yeah. It's, there's something different in my brain because I'm, I just have a discomfort socializing outside my small, small little group of people. All right. Wondered if anybody else was having that. All right. We will talk about politics. So imagine, if you will, a advanced alien species came to Earth and said, uh, could you explain to us your political system here in America? And he, I'd try to do it, and it would look like this. I go, well, we've got this republic democracy kind of situation, which is a system which tries to give the public what the public wants you know, by a majority. We don't, we don't vote directly on everything. We elect people to represent us, you know, our majority opinion for the most part. And so the alien would say, ah, okay. So how, how do your politicians know what it is you want? And I'd say, well, we have polling. There's polling on every topic. So they can look at the polls. There are some situations where they won't go with the polling, but, but generally the point of the system is that for the most part, what the public wants their representatives will vote for. And so then the alien would say, ah, polling, polling. So the polling, um, so once they've separated the people who are paying attention and and they poll the people who are smart and know the topic, and I go, oh, 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 oh." no, don't don't make an assumption. No, they poll whoever answers the phone. And then uh, the alien says, wait a minute, The, the way you decide whose opinion to listen to is who answered the phone? Yes. So then the alien would say, I have more questions. I have more questions. Would that include people who don't understand the topic you're asking about whatsoever? Oh, yes. In fact, it's mostly those people. Well, like mostly, you mean like 51%? Mm, I wish. I wish. It's closer to 95. So only 5% of the people actually understand the topic. Ooh, no. I I didn't mean to mislead you. Those 5% are brainwashed. Uh, Hold on, hold on. You're saying there's two categories. There's people who don't know anything about the topic because they're not paying attention and it's complicated. But then there's this little group who seems to know a lot about the topic, but they actually have been just brainwashed by their preferred source of uh, media. Yes, yes, now you're catching on. And then the alien says, oh, wow, that's an interesting system. And then he says, but at least at least they exclude the people who have mental illness. Because you're not going to pull people with mental illness to find out how you should run things. And then I say, oh, this is embarrassing. We do include them. Yeah, we don't exclude anybody for any kind of mental illness. And then the alien says, well, I mean, that's probably not that bad. I mean, like what percentage of people have mental illness? You know, can't be that much. And I said, ooh, well, okay, on, on one side of the political aisle, it's, it's not terrible. But on the other side, mm, 50% of the women have been seeking uh, mental health, uh, professional help. And then the uh, alien says, well... Uh, obviously, the group of people with the fewest crazy people are in charge, so that should work out well, right? Ooh. No, as it turns out, the group with 50% of the women who are seeking mental health, they're actually, they have more of a majority at the moment. President, yeah, Senate. Not the Senate. Um, no, Senate. Yeah, but whatever. Um And then the alien says, all right, so let me put this all together. You take the average opinion of 95% of the people who are not paying attention to each topic, the 5% who are just brainwashed and are not even exposed to the other side, and then about half of them on the dominant side have mental illness. And then our politicians that we've elected using that group of people uh, they try to look at our average, you know, the majority opinion, and then they take that opinion and then they make laws based on it. 
Is that what you're saying? And then I say, ooh, almost. You're close. No, what the politicians do is they find ways to suck money out of the system uh, to keep themselves in power and enrich themselves sometimes on the side. And then the alien says, all right, well, okay, I hear what you're saying, but, but in addition to that, they make laws that the public wants. Ooh, uh, mm, sometimes. It, it can go that way. More often, the public is wondering why it doesn't go that way, and we never really hear. For example, have you heard of something called TikTok? And the alien would say, no, what is TikTok? they go, well, I don't have time to explain it in detail, but I can give you a, sort of a demonstration. TikTok would be a whole bunch of videos that are roughly like this. And then the alien would say, what? And I'd say, yeah. It's basically people look at people acting like that all day long. And then the alien says, well, why would anybody look at that? And I would say, because the people doing it are attractive. You know, when I did the imitation, you know, maybe it wasn't a good representation because I've not had any surgery. But that's the basic idea. And then uh, the alien says, but everybody loves it, right? Oh, yeah, but, you know, it's our enemies are using it to brainwash us and take over the country. Turn us all into Uyghurs. And... Um, and that's our system. But the alien says, but at least your your leaders will ban it in your country. And they'll say, hmm, I wish. And then the alien would say, you know, we had plans to give you our advanced technology to cure all, all the physical and mental problems and make you a spacefaring nation, but Honestly, I think we're just going to kill you motherfuckers because you're crazy. And then a gigantic beam of energy hits the earth, goes to the core, and then we all die. And that's why if aliens ever land on earth and you happen to be the first one there and they ask you about our political system, lie, lie. It's the only way you're going to save the world. Next story. So I uh, suggested that uh, a good solution for uh, Gaza would be, since you can't really just put the Palestinians back in charge because you would imagine it would just turn into Hamas too, and you can't let Israel forever just own this area that's you know pretty much entirely just Palestinians. So what do you do? And so I suggested, what do, why don't you let or make an offer the Saudi Arabia could administer it, so they'd be sort of like a professional leadership class, but there would be a umbrella of Israeli security because secu- you know, Israel would have the last say if anything got out of control. And then use the Israeli military to protect a small nuclear power plant uh, that would do desalinization and power and modernize everything and make it basically uh, Switzerland with sand. So that was my idea, because at least it gives you some kind of brainstorming of you know what could be, so you don't have to focus entirely on the horror that's happening at the moment. Now, um, so I was waiting with great interest to see what Saudi Arabia would say about the whole situation, and I was encouraged, because they finally did talk, you know, MBS, the crown prince, and they put out what I would call the most generic um, anti-war statement you could possibly do. It's like, uh, it's really bad to hurt civilians. I sure wish, I sure wish no innocent people got killed. Now, try to, try to just read between the lines. It would be really, really easy for, you know, anybody who is a, say, could benefit from looking like an enemy of Israel. It'd be really easy for them to pile on and just say, you're, 
you're perpetuating uh, all, you know war crimes. Actually, China said that. China said that uh, they called it uh, collective punishment, which technically is not, I guess. Um, they called it that and said it's basically a war crime. Now, that's rich coming from the country that has the Uyghurs in prison camps, but that's what they said. Now, my point is Saudi Arabia could have responded like that as well. And you could easily imagine sometime in the distant past, maybe they would have. But they do have more of an interest in making peace with Israel if they can get past this. So I was encouraged by the fact that their statement was so generic. It was almost like they went out of their way to make it just blend into the background of other people's comments. So that's a good sign, because it means that they haven't rejected some kind of peace with Israel you know, when we get past this. Um, and I did see, when I put this idea on uh, the X platform, I believe I saw nobody disagree. Here's the disagreements I heard. Why would you give a nuclear power plant to Hamas because they'll just dismantle it and make a nuclear bomb? Okay, did anybody think that was part of my plan, to give a nuclear power plant to Hamas? No, no. You would have to have the Israelis completely control the nuclear power plant. Right? Um, and I think, am I wrong that the Saudis were looking for nuclear power too, right? So I think Saudi Arabia has an interest in, you know, building up some skills in that area as well. And I'd be less worried about them having a nuclear bomb because, you know, probably they could if they wanted one. Um, so the fact that I, I got, I think I got no pushback except dumb pushback. The, the only pushback was people said, what, you know, why would you do that when Hamas is there? But... I'm assuming Hamas is gone under all scenarios, aren't you? There, there's no scenario where anybody who identifies as Hamas is still going to be in charge or have you know access to you know organizing much. Though obviously it's impossible to get rid of it totally, but there won't be much left. So that was the plan. I'm open to a better one. Um, I had a little uh, back and forth with the comic Dave Smith. Many of you know comic Dave Smith talks a lot about politics as well. And I asked him, um, he had some he had some comments about the uh, uh, how brutal it's going to be in Gaza, which we all, I think we all have a similar amount of empathy, I hope. Um, but I asked him, what was the alternative? Because I get a little tired of the people saying Israel should not be doing what it's doing. Nobody likes it. We could all hate it, but what's the alternative? Because they can't just let Hamas stay there and regrow. And so I asked that, and comic Dave Smith said, uh, among other things, that uh, instead of going in, he would fortify the borders. Fortify the borders to make sure that they couldn't run over and do it again. Is it my imagination... Or is that the worst idea you've ever heard? Fortify the borders. Now, I get that we're trying to fortify our borders, and it's hard, right? It's really hard. But we're trying to do it. So do I think that they should fortify their borders? Well, yes. Do you think they didn't try to fortify their borders? <laughs> or, or is it just that now we've learned more so we could do it better? You know, we meaning the Israelis in this case. I don't think you could make a border wall good enough to keep people from getting in. Do you? Because there were a thousand people and a number of them were hang gliders. Yeah. How do you stop a hang glider? Well, you could. I mean, if you had a machine gun turret on every, you know, every hundred foot of fence and it was, you know, a person was in charge, well, you could machine gun anybody who tried to parag paraglide in, I suppose. But to me, it just seems like getting a thousand people across a border is the easiest thing in the world. And it wouldn't stop them from making missiles, would it? Wouldn't they just improve their missiles and improve their drones? 
Wouldn't Hamas just end up building a drone army that blackens the sky above Tel Aviv? So, um, so here's my take. Is there any alternative to what Israel is doing at the moment, as, as gruesome as it is? I don't see one. I, I don't think fortifying the uh, walls and hoping it doesn't happen again. I just don't see it. Okay. Um, let's talk about the Gaza water situation. As you know, in the fog of war, uh, everything is a lie. So you should not believe anything you hear from a war zone. Ever. <laughs> you know, at some point, you'll probably um, you know, collapse on one interpretation or another because we sort of have to. Our brains, our brains need to get things settled. So you'll probably come to some opinion about what's happening or has happened. But the odds of it being true, huh, pretty low. Because nobody has an incentive to tell the truth in a time of war. But here are some of the conflicting things I'm hearing about their water supply. In my opinion, the water supply should be one of the biggest variables to predict what's going to happen and how bad it will be. So I'm hearing the following things. One is that uh, the water that Israel cut off from Gaza was only about 11% of all the water supply. (laughs) And that there's actually an aquifer below Gaza that is their primary, as in 90% or so, of all their water comes from underground. And they still have pumps, and they're still pumping it. Now, I don't know if that's true. Now, okay, here's the second part, as you're prompting me. There's also word that the aquifer is polluted from poor management. It either has wastewater in there or seawater plus both. So it may not be drinkable, right? Next question is, in the context of an emergency, could you boil it? do, Do they have a workaround? I mean, it wouldn't be a good workaround, but... Is it even possible? I don't know. Let me continue. So these are all the things we don't really know. We've heard that Gaza has been out of water for two days. I saw this from a source on X. But does that really mean that what they're out of is the Israeli 11% of the water? Because that's when the pipeline was cut. Is that the same as being out of water? Because I'm getting uh, conflicting reports that they have plenty of water. But what does it mean to have plenty of water, again, if some of it's polluted? It could be that they have plenty of water in the areas that weren't hit hard because all they needed there was a pump, uh, you know, a pump that they could uh, manually pump. And apparently those exist. So it could it be that there are portions of Gaza where they definitely don't have water, um, but could they walk to where there's water? Is it walking distance? Because most of Gaza is, is so small, you know, it would be hard, but you could almost walk to anywhere. And then the next question is, is Hamas preventing anybody from relocating from where there's no food and water to where there is? And there are reports that they are. I don't know if those are accurate, of course. What's probably true is that everything is happening. What's probably true is that everything's true, but you don't know how true. For example, I'm sure it's true that somebody is out of water. I don't know if that's most people or just some people. It's almost certainly true that Hamas is limiting travel. But everywhere? All people all the time for all reasons? I don't know. don't know. And would it change? because it would be more dire, would they then change their minds? I don't know. don't know. It would probably depend on who they think would get blamed. If they thought the attackers would get blamed, they might just let the residents starve. If they think they'll get blamed, they might be a little flexible on it. All right. Um, So you put it all together, and... Oh, and the other thing is that uh, there's this miles-long convoy of trucks with food and presumably water uh, in Egypt. 
that just needs to go ahead to get into Gaza. But does it help if they're sitting there in Egypt and not allowed in? So is that a factor or not? My, my assumption is this, is that Israel is going to try as hard as possible to make sure that there's food and water, however you have to do it, whatever it takes. I feel like that they're going to try as hard as they can to make sure the citizens are fed, because it would be terrible for Israel to lose you know, a huge number of people to starvation. That's just a terrible look. Yeah, that doesn't work well with anything that they want to accomplish. All right, so we'll keep an eye on that. Keep an eye on the water. All right, Harvard continues to get hammered. Uh, The president of Harvard made a statement that was not well received by everybody. Now, I'm going to talk about the president of Harvard, um, but I will not assign a pronoun because I did not see the president of Harvard um, assign a pronoun, so I don't know. Now, I can only know, I'm just basing on physical look. If you can imagine Don Lemon with gigantic glasses, that's what we're talking about. Uh, the, the, they's name is, I'll just use they, them. So they, they's name, they's, they name is uh, Claudia Gay. Last name is Gay. I, I assume that was a given name. Um, anyway, Harvard President Claudia Gay, uh, they said, our university embraces a commitment to free expression. That commitment extends to views that many of us find objectionable or outrageous. We do not punish or sanction people for expressing such views. So Harvard President um, says that they're, they're a bastion of free speech. Megan Kelly begs to differ. She says, you literally scored last out of all colleges on FIRE's free speech evaluation. FIRE must be some organization that evaluates free speech. Uh, Now that it's terrorist sympathizers doing the talking, you're a free speech champion, please. (laughs) So in the real world, there's there's a rating organization that rated Harvard dead last in free speech. I feel so sorry for the the people who went there. Oh my God, it would be so embarrassing. So uh, anyway, uh, New Zealand had an election in which the uh, the past ruling party that had been the Labour Party of Yacinda Ardern. So she was a notable left leaning pro-lockdown vaccination kind of a person, but has been replaced with a uh, by a crushing, crushing victory, they say, by a conservative party in a national election. So some are saying, oh, it's the sign of things changing. Do you think so? Or do you just think it's a New Zealand thing? I don't know. I don't know if it's a big sign, but it's a Oh, Peter Zayn says both past and new governments are centrist. He might be right about that. I, I was I was going to say it's probably not a big deal. I wouldn't make a big deal about it. And Peter Peter Zayn agrees. So that's two people who say don't make too much of it. All right. There's a big question of where will the Gaza refugees go. Some say there could be as many as a million of them, and you would not be surprised to know that uh, some members of the squad want them to come here. Uh, Representative Jamal Bowman, for example, um, wants them to come here. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, Scott, Scott, it wouldn't be so bad to help the children because, you know, we care more about children. And, you know, the children are not not fighters, right? Right? I would say that the children are the most dangerous and the ones you definitely shouldn't let in because I assume that they've been propagandized by their schools to a mindset that would be almost impossible to get rid of. So you should consider them as infected with a propaganda virus that unless you could eradicate it somehow, 
uh, would be super dangerous to mix them in with people who do not have that virus. Now, did I make a comment about anybody's genes? No. Did I make a comment about anybody's culture? No. These are very specific situations of specific messages that were trained to specific people. It has everything to do with propaganda and nothing to do with anybody's ethnic or religious um, inclinations. All right. Um, Joel Pollack was reporting that uh, the, Israel, the Israeli military has probably the oddest problem any military ever had, uh, too many soldiers. So they called for uh, the reservists. They thought they needed 150,000. 360,000 showed up and are, and are refusing to leave. <laughs> They're refusing to leave the border. Wow. Um, so that's just a hell of a thing. Um, is anybody else, does anybody else know that, um, is anybody else getting demonetized on YouTube for talking about the war? Am I the only one? So I've been getting demonetized for my recent podcasts. What is your best guess? of what I've said that would be different from what other people have said that would get me demonetized. Because I haven't violated any terms of service. I, I've got no notices, and I'm, not even, I'm nowhere near violating any terms of service. Hmm. What do you think it is? Do you think I'm just blacklisted somehow? Did I, did I debunk too much propaganda? I have a theory what it is. <laughs> but I don't think I'm going to say it so I can test my theory. I think there's one word I use that I'm, I haven't used today. And I'm going to see if that makes a difference. I'm going to ignore that one word. All right. Um... On the X platform, there is a uh, study from 2021. And I would remind you that all data is uh, non credible. We just live in a world where you can't believe any data. But I'll tell you what it is because it's a story that the data exists, even if the data isn't exactly right. But what it was is a study by some American National Election Studies group. And they tried to see, um, they looked at four uh, demographic groups in the U.S., um, black, white, Hispanic, and Asian Americans. And they said, what do you think about your own group? And then what's your, you know, how positively or negatively do you feel about the other three groups? And when they, when they talked to white people, it turns out that their opinion of all four groups, including their own, was about the same. A little bit, little bit advantage to their own group. So the white people were a little more positive about white people, but it was in a narrow band with how they felt about everybody else. Nothing that you would worry about. The other three groups were wildly different, meaning that they had wildly better opinions of their own group than of the other groups. And the, in each case, the white group was ranked the lowest. Now, do you think that data is accurate? And would that be a place that white people should hang around, if it were true? Now, you have the same problem with the, um, the Rasmussen poll that had similar kinds of... Directionally, it was a similar kind of thing, but it had a small sample group. So some people said, Scott, you cannot judge the whole country by fewer than 200 people. To which I said, yeah, you can. It's called math. <laughs> it's called an 8% degree of, uh, 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 8%, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the uh, error possibility. What's the word for that? The uh, margin of error, yeah. So an 8% margin of error. Now, ideally, you'd want to do thousands of people and get your margin of error down to one or two. 
But if the point of the survey says something like half of the people believe something, and you would be alarmed if even 10% of the people thought something, it's plenty of people. (laughs) You don't need more people if you selected them right in the first place. The selection matters. But the 140, or whatever it was, is actually enough. As long as you're looking for gigantic differences, it's, it's plenty. If you're looking for a small difference, you'd want more than 1,000 people. If you're looking for a, a very broad, you know, general sense of things, yeah, 140 people, if they're correctly chosen, within 8% of the correct answer, probably. So that's all, everything you need. Now, again, I wouldn't trust any specific poll. I wouldn't trust any data at all in the, in the whole world. I don't trust any of it. And, but if there are enough things that point in the same direction and it agrees with your observation, then you start taking it seriously. And what we have here, the indications are, if it's true, um, a real big mental virus that could uh, end the country, meaning that there's some kind of educational process, whether it's the media or the schools or both, the, there's an educational process that is setting up the country for cataclysm. And it's, it's based on how people are trained to see the other. So we've clearly left the melting pot behind And we're now into the oppressor-oppressed model, which should guarantee um, the end of America. Because design is destiny. Now, we still have time to change the design, but our current design is for the end of the United States. Very clearly. (laughs) Very clearly, the end of the United States. Now, I do have confidence that we'll adjust, but we're not going to adjust unless we understand where we're heading. And let me say it as clearly as possible, our current country's design is a guaranteed destruction. Guaranteed. Open borders and promotion of people based on characteristics which are not related directly to capability. That's all you need. (laughs) And and then the the othering of one group, which almost certainly causes massive disruption. So... That's where we're heading. But I do have confidence that the Adam's Law of slow-moving disasters will adjust. We'll find our way out. We always do. Um, But you might all have to move to New Zealand or something. I don't know. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is all I needed to say. Was there any story I missed? Sunday's kind of a slow day. Poland? What about Poland? Oh, I know what you're saying. Go to Poland. (laughs) Australia locked down hard. Yeah, but their government just changed. Soviet purges were the end result of a slow-moving disaster. True. There will be purges. You just described why I'm demonetized? No, there's a specific word I'm avoiding saying that I think is the thing. So this will be a test. I'll just avoid saying that word. Starts with a C. All right. If you have not seen my Dilbert Reborn comic for today, you are missing what most people are saying is the funniest one I've ever written because it does use some profanity in a colorful way. And you would have to be a subscriber on the X platform and subscribe to me with that little subscribe button up in the profile or to be on the scottadams.locals.com platform where you get the comic plus a whole bunch else. And if you didn't already know, my book, Reframe Your Brain, is changing the world. Actually, literally, changing the world. So pick that up because I know you want a copy. It's doing great, by the way. The The reviews are like nothing I've ever seen. They're amazing. All right. All you wonderful people. Yeah, and if you look at the other comments, you can see the comments are tremendous. 
Um, and I would say again, it is the book. Here's my claim. It's the book that for the least amount of effort reading it, because it's, it's written to be real easy to read, uh, you'll get the biggest change in your life. And you won't have to keep a diary. You know, you won't have to do any crazy stuff. You just have to read it. Uh, all it does is change the software in your head. And all you need to do that is just be exposed to it. Just read it once, and it will update the software in your head. All right. That's all you need to know for today. So thanks for joining me on the X and YouTube platforms. I'm going to talk to the people on Locals a little extra because they are awesome and they deserve a little extra today. Bye for now. All right.